good morning again in the heart of the retreat. Uh, this is a really interesting time usually in the retreat. And um, yeah, in my first talk, I talked about suffering and happiness. And most of you put your hand up to say that you were most motivated by ending suffering. Hopefully by now you're starting to see that the result of ending a little bit of suffering is quite a lot of happiness. And that grows incrementally as we go deeper and deeper inside and understand this world. And today I wanted to talk about a practice called um, working with the senses, let's say. Uh, sometimes it's called sense restraint, but it could also be seen in two ways, as both guarding the senses and also quietening them down. And um, I wanted to start with a little quote by somebody who had now gone to the Deva realm called Rohitasa. And in this person's life as a human being, they had great psychic powers and they used to travel uh, on foot, literally to the ends of the world, thinking that they could make an end of suffering by traveling the world and trying to understand the world outside. And it sounds like quite a dumb thing to do, but I was thinking about it this morning and I was thinking, actually, that's what most of us do, isn't it? And it says in this sutta that this person used to travel the world with their psychic powers, stopping only to go to the toilet, to eat and drink, and to lie down when they were tired. But they traveled the whole end of the earth and they never found what they were looking for. They never found the end of old age, sickness and death. So now they've passed away and they've gone to the Deva realm. So don't try and walk the ends of the earth to get to the Deva realm, but, uh, because it's still not finished there. You're still... Um, in this world, you still haven't escaped it entirely. So this uh, Deva, this uh, heavenly being, comes to the Buddha from the Deva realm and says to him, Is it possible by traveling to know, see or reach the end of the world where one is not born, does not grow old and die, does not pass away or get reborn? And of course, the Buddha says, by traveling, one cannot see or reach the end of the world where one's not born, does not grow old and die, does not pass away or get reborn. And this is the kind of Zen koan part. Yet without having reached the end of the world, there's no making an end of suffering. And this is a nice part. It is in this fathom-long body, that means this body, however tall, short, medium, fat, round, black, white, female, male, transgender, gender non-binary, whatever in this body endowed with its perception of mind that I proclaim the world, the origin, the cessation, and the way leading to the cessation of the world. So in other words, our body is the world that we have to explore and travel within to understand this world. And essentially, what is this world to us? we can break that down to the six senses. It's the world of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and knowing with the mind, right? And this is where suffering arises and can cease. So it's really important to realize this because uh, it's not about turning off this world. Somebody came to the Buddha, and this is in the Majjhima Nikaya number 152, Indriya Sambhava Sutta. I can write down the references if people are interested. And um, a Brahmin comes up to the Buddha and he says, yes, yes, my teacher teaches sense restraint and how to develop the sense faculties. Basically, we don't look at things. We just close our eyes and we don't hear things. We just remain deaf to the world. And the Buddha says, well, in that case, a blind person or a deaf person would have developed their faculties. But a blind person or a deaf person doesn't necessarily have any more wisdom than the rest of us, right? So it's not possible to train the senses and to uh, overcome the craving and aversion that can arise, arise in response to any sense contact that we have by simply turning off the senses. And many people have tried that. There's a story of Ajahn Chah, who apparently in his early days had a lot of lust. This should give you hope, especially if you're struggling with that or forms of that. Maybe you feel a lot of craving when you see the breakfast platter laid out there and you think, oh goodness, there's a big queue, you know, shall I just kind of nip in? Shall I look like I'm being really <laughs> considerate but just kind of get in first? <laughs> Does that happen sometimes? Anyway, Ajahn Chah had a lot of uh, 
craving a lot of lust and he decided one man's retreat to simply overcome it by deciding not to look at any woman who came into the monastery, which is not that easy because most of the people serving the monks are women. But he managed to do it, keeping his eyes very downcast and using a lot of restraint, probably a lot of willpower. And he managed to be free from any kind of uh, thoughts or sensuality that would disturb his mind. He thought, fantastic, this is the trick. But then, of course, what happened at the end of that retreat? He had to raise his eyes. <laughs> and the first person he saw, who was not particularly attractive by conventional standards, whatever that might be, he had huge amounts of lust arise. So it didn't really work. Yeah, I had one example <laughs> years and years ago, not of lust, but um, of just not seeing something because I was restraining my senses so much during the retreat. It was, I think, a 30-day retreat in India and uh, we're advised to just really work as if we were alone so we don't look around, we don't kind of even try and match up the shoes to the particular retreatant or anything like that. <laughs> you only see shoes, right? You don't see faces. And uh, one day I'd put my laundry in for washing and uh, this was probably around the middle of the retreat, so it's a 30-day retreat. And I waited and I used to walk between, you know, the meditation hall, my room and the dining room basically with the eyes downcast, and I waited for some sign that the laundry was finished. I thought it would be somewhere that I could see it, um, and it never came back. <laughs> so I just made use of the couple of dresses that I had, you know, this kind of, it's actually a very simple dress, like a kurta and a little pants, very, very um, comfortable and simple. Uh, and I thought, never mind, you know. And by the sort of fourth or fifth day, I thought, okay, they probably lost it because they're doing laundry for like about 500 people. So I thought, never mind, you know, it'll come back again. And then really towards the end, about 15 days later, I sort of looked a little bit up and noticed this sort of row of people that were going away from the dining hall and in another direction. I thought, what are they going towards? And then I saw these tables with the laundry laid out. <laughs> and my laundry had been there all the time. But I hadn't looked, you know, and this is kind of sense restraint without a lot of wisdom, you know, this is kind of a <laughs> thinking that you can manage somehow without even looking around. And the problem that all of us have, unfortunately, is that uh, we are pulled around by the world of sight, sound, smell, taste and touch. <coughs> and we have to know exactly what our triggers are. So there's this beautiful um, practice that the Buddha talked about. Um, called sense restraint and it's a kind of sila, it's a kind of virtue and it falls somewhere in the gradual training between um, the virtue of body and speech, so living a beautiful harmless life, not doing anything that's going to hurt or harm yourself or others through actions of body or speech, between there and mindfulness which Ajahnita was talking about yesterday the kind of mindfulness we have to develop by being present to what we're doing in our day-to-day -day life, including on a retreat. You know, we can build that mindfulness up in our activities between the meditation. And uh, this helps to um, have mindfulness established when we start to sit and watch the breath. But even between there, there's another kind of practice which involves being aware of the sensory input, but also noticing its effect on our mind. So we're not just aware of eating, you know, of the taste. We're actually aware of this place between uh, the food and the taste, if you like, or let's say, the mind that knows the taste of the food and what arises in between, yeah? So is that taste leading to craving? Is it leading to aversion? Is it leading to, I don't know, a bad digestion maybe? Is it not very good for you? But you're eating it anyway because it tastes really nice. And so in that place we can put our attention and see how this whole thing is working and actually change the way we perceive the input at the senses in order to increase the wholesome states. So this is a practice that's very similar to right effort which comes before right mindfulness in the Noble Eightfold Path. And um, also, as I say, it's a subtler form of virtue. So it's, in a sense, the virtue of the mind. We're starting to move inside and see how our mind is behaving and whether it behaves in ways that's helpful to us. 
how do we think about life? How do we think about things that have happened? You know, what's our perspective on that? And I'll go into this in more detail, but another really important role of um, guarding or governing the senses is that it helps to weaken the hindrances that arise in relation to this world. Yeah, when there's a hindrance arising, when there's craving or ill will, it's almost invariably arising, in fact it is invariably arising, to the sensory world. Or thoughts about that world, you know, thoughts that come in the mind, even when you've shut your eyes and you're not hearing, or maybe you're not really seeing provocative sights, but still those images will replay in your mind and we react to that. Yeah? So we're always reacting to the world outside, even when we're sitting down to meditate. And so this practice is helping us to um, clear and tidy up the mind. So in India, when I did my first retreat in 1996, I went into the tr retreat fresh out of travels and having my whole world open up to me, kind of, I could do whatever I wanted. My mother wasn't there to tell me to come back home you know, any particular hour, so, you know, I could really experience the most incredible things, you know, um, people, places, mountains that I'd never been to before at a very young age. I mean, it was really quite mind-blowing in a way. And when I sat down to meditate on my first retreat, it was though all the contents of my mind just came pouring out, you know, whatever I'd put in there all this time people that I'd never thought about, songs that I didn't even think I'd heard, all came tumbling out of the mind. And uh, I don't know, maybe in Norway you don't have quite so much junk in your minds. You have the forests, <laughs> you have the mountains and the lakes. There's a quietness, even in the landscape, that perhaps helps you not to be so overloaded. But still, we live in the digital age, and a digital age is very, very challenging, I think, for sense restraint, you know. Even if you think you're only going on your phone for like half an hour, you end up being on there, you know, scrolling through social media for like the next hour. And then suddenly you feel exhausted, right? It's, it's tiring to have all this sensory input. So um, this was my experience. And later on, when I learned about um, guarding the senses in daily life, I realized that it's, uh, the simile that came to mind is like tidying a cupboard. So you still have sight, sounds, smells, tastes, smells, touches, etc. But you don't have that lingering kind of residue from them. You deal with them there and then in a wholesome way and don't let them kind of linger in the mind. So it's kind of like instead of opening a cupboard full of filthy clothes and I don't know, you may have shoved some books in there, you may have shoved all kinds of stuff in your linen cupboard and you don't know where to find it, it just comes tumbling out. Now, with sense restraint, you open that cupboard and you find, oh, here's the clean sheets, here's my socks, all like nicely put in pairs, and here is the books, usually in another place, and everything has its place. So when you sit down with such a tidy mind, you know where to find the loving kindness shelf. You know where the mindfulness is kept. You know that, okay, right now I need a little bit of... Uh, um, inspiration. So you can remember things that have happened in your life that inspire you. You go to the inspiration shelf. Yeah? And the mind is tidy. You know where to find things. You know what to do with things. You don't have to work out all your um, past grudges and resentments on your meditation seat. You can take care of some of that in daily life. So it's a really huge field. And even though here we are mostly focusing on our meditation, this is going to be a massive support to you because there's a lot of time during the day that you're actually not in formal meditation. And at that time, you can start to be aware of the way your senses are impacting you. One thing is we get affected by the impressions of the senses. Another thing you might notice is that sometimes you go out there to seek stimulation at any of the sense doors. <laughs> I'm seeing some almost guilty expressions, but there's no need to feel <laughs> guilt about that. This is what we do. And it's up to us what we pick up. You know, We can have a little bit of a skill there and uh, focus on those things that bring about a feeling of peace. So, for example, you can look outside and you can think, oh, 
and it looks freezing cold. This is terrible. I just want to go on my holiday that I've booked to the Bahamas or wherever. You know, I'm not going outside, even though your body could do with the exercise. But another way of looking is, oh, it looks so peaceful. You know, the snow is really soft, really fresh. And if you do go outside, yes, it's cold, but it's also really invigorating, right? We can frame it in a different way. I went on a little walk the other day and uh, someone was actually sitting on a bench overlooking the, uh, what would be a lake, the no-go area of this retreat. And, uh, and they would just look so peaceful and I stopped and just listened. And there was not a single sound in that whole environment. It was so still. It was incredibly quiet. And I carried on walking, not really far to the top of a mountain, but, you know, until I couldn't see this hotel or most of the little houses scattered about. And I was completely alone in this beautiful, peaceful, white environment. This colour actually has a very calming effect. Yeah. It's not a stimulating colour, it's just very neutral, very peaceful. And I've heard from some of the retreatants too that they had even images in meditation of being on top of mountains and feeling tremendous peace come over them. So these impressions are also there to pick up from our shelf of perceptions. You know, we can, we can tune into those things that lead to peace and that start to quieten down the sense. Before I go further into that, I wanted to talk about what the senses are, first of all, and how they arise, because this is really important to um, have some insight into this whole process and what makes this world tick, what makes us tick, if you like, and how it's completely conditioned, how these uh, senses are quite insubstantial and not really worth pursuing to a great extent. So the way that the Buddha describes these senses is that we have our internal sense, or if you like, the sense base, and that is actually the organ, right? So the organ of the eye, the nose, the ear, the tongue, the body, and the mind. I don't know if there's really an organ for the mind, it's kind of the mind can be aware of all of that. Sometimes now in modern science people equate, or not even science is it it's just uh, our western perspective sometimes we equate the brain with the mind but science is increasingly showing that the brain is just a vehicle through which the mind can process information so the mind just uses the brain as its kind of physical base and the brain actually limits this is really great this is another book i'd recommend it's called after by bruce grayson and it's about um, near-death experiences and he's a doctor and a scientist who's researched this most of his life. And he, his theory is that um, the brain actually limits the information we, that the mind can know just down to whatever's going to protect the body. So it filters everything else as not important. And it focuses only on those things we need to know to keep the body alive. It's really interesting. So when people have these near-death experiences which, which, where they leave the body and the mind is basically free from these five senses, suddenly the range of what they can know with the mind expands enormously beyond you know, reason, beyond rationale. And they do start to experience feelings that are very similar to the ones we experience in meditation, of being, of course, out of the body, first of all, the body fading away, but then enormous amounts of peace and um, calm and feelings of love. And the mind still operates, you know, it can conjure up images maybe if they're a Christian of Jesus or even the hand of God reaching down from a cloud or fields of poppies, whatever it is. Unfortunately, they didn't test any, they didn't have any data from Buddhists, I don't think. I don't know whether they would have met the Buddha, even though he's not around. But <laughs> we basically create images to fit with our experience and our view. But the interesting thing here is how the brain is a kind of organ through which the mind um, works but it's not equated to the mind the mind is so much bigger than that so anyway we have these organs and then we have their objects right so for example with sight the object could be a person who's sitting right in front of me or it could be an apple for example and then we have sounds 
maybe that apple when you bite it has this crunch yeah it has a certain form like it's round it's maybe green or it's red it's shiny and then it has a sound then it has a taste right so it tastes a little bit um, sour maybe crisp or sweet various degrees of sweet it's not really a flavor you can describe and uh, the smell very fresh fragrant smell that you know it, this is apple this is the way the mind perceives it and the mind of course which knows um, all of this but then this is not enough for the senses to arise the senses arise when the external object and the um, internal organ come in contact so these two meet and there's contact and from that contact, our senses arise. So then there is seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, and knowing with the mind. So this is very important. It might sound obvious, but the point here is that these senses are not inside waiting to come out. They're actually contingent. Seeing is contingent on contact between the eye and a form. Yeah? Smelling is contingent on contact between the nose and a smell. Only then uh, nose consciousness arises. It's a particular type of consciousness. And if it was just, you know, that was the end of the process, there wouldn't be too much trouble. We'd just be smelling, tasting, seeing, knowing, etc. Maybe the problem would end there. But this contact is what then causes a feeling, a feeling to arise. Yeah? Contact conditions feeling. And we get sensations, we get feelings in the body and mind based on any of these senses that can be pleasant, unpleasant, or somewhere in between. So there's this massive sort of range of feelings that can arise and we basically perceive them or interpret them as pleasant, unpleasant, or somehow neutral. Yeah? And of course, the pleasant feelings tend to give rise to craving, the unpleasant feelings tend to give rise to aversion, you don't want this. And the neutral feelings can give rise to just a sense of kind of boredom or not really being very aware, delusion, you know, ignorance about what's happening. You're kind of only half alive, yeah? And all this is because of contact. So this is very important because when we can start to work with these feelings, notice how these feelings are arising and notice that they're actually conditioned. There's nothing very substantial there. They're only arising because of this contact then it can take away the fuel of reactivity. Yeah. And we can work with this in different ways. So it's the reaction, right, that creates this cycle of suffering. And the Buddha talks about this in what's called the fire sermon. Uh, I don't have the reference here. I think it's somewhere in the Samyutta Nikaya. But it's the third um, teaching that he gives after his enlightenment. And he says that basically... The eye forms, eye consciousness, the contact and the feeling that arises is on fire. On fire with craving, with aversion and with delusion. Also on fire with old age, sickness and death. Because none of these things are going to last, right? And he says that because of this, actually there's different translations, but um, one translation is that these things are burning with uh, craving, greed, aversion, and delusion. Another translation is that they're weighed down. Uh, ditta can also mean a weighing down. So the senses are weighing us down. Yeah? And also um, blinding us. Blinding us. And this is very interesting because this is exactly what the hindrances do as well. Yeah, they kind of obscure a deeper happiness, the happiness of the mind, the happiness of peace. So whenever we um, have a lot of stimulation in the senses, when, you know, when we're um, very stimulated, we can't experience the peace in the mind. It's as though they obscure that inner peace. And that's why the Buddha said that uh, practicing restraint of the senses leads to unblemished happiness. So all of these teachings are to lead to deeper happiness, as Ajanito said last night. It's not that we turn away from the world out of aversion or disgust, because that's another defilement. It's just that we see the limitation of these things, and we see that there's something much more peaceful when those things quieten down. 
So for us on this retreat, you know, we've noticed, hopefully already, that when we're in meditation and the, um, the body starts to calm down, there's already a great relief. Because this body is a burden, it is something that weighs us down, it's something heavy. And the various feelings that arise in the body can really pull us around by the nose. <laughs> you know, how much of the time, even in our meditation, are we just hoping for some pleasant feelings to arise? You know, looking for the bliss, looking for the, uh, the joy, the rapture, etc. And we forget that it's precisely that craving for those feelings that keeps them away, that makes them so elusive. It's that craving that kind of keeps on generating a sense of lack, a sense of suffering, and, uh, and doesn't allow these things to calm down. We keep on getting entangled, enmeshed, trying to fix our bodies. Sometimes the best thing to do is to just leave your body alone. You know, we settle the body down in a comfortable position as far as we can. And then once it's settled, we just let it be. We just let it alone. The same thing with the mind. At first you'll probably notice that there's a lot of mental impressions of things that have happened in the past. One of the things that can often arise that's a big hindrance is resentment to a person. Or even ill will towards yourself. And that ill will towards ourself is what sometimes... Uh, prevents us or makes us feel not worthy of experiencing peace, right? And we get in the way of the whole process. We feel like, oh, we don't really deserve to feel calm, to feel peaceful, to experience happiness inside. Maybe because the rest of the world, you know, is other people are suffering. How can I be happy when other people are, you know, in great pain? Or maybe you've just always been taught that you have to deserve it, you know, you have to really uh, succeed, you have to prove yourself or whatever it is. Or maybe there's some guilt there, some, uh, something you haven't let go of yet. And the Buddha talked about um, learning to overcome resentment by looking at things a different way. There's a lovely sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, I think. I think it is on uh, ways to overcome resentment. And usually this is to another person, but it can also apply to ourselves. And one of the ways is that if you see somebody who is usually, uh, I don't know, behaving badly, maybe their speech is really coarse, then you can look at another part of that person. So this is how we train our senses to look at something different. We don't grab on to that bad speech. We don't kind of take the speech, bring it inside us, repeat it to ourselves. They said this, how could they say this? You know, when they said this, I felt such and such. Instead of that, we look at the other side of the person. Maybe there's some things that that person does that are really beautiful, that are really kind and generous. Okay, they might have bad speech from time to time, but not all the time. And not only do we only do we look at the other part of the person, we also learn to engage with the other part of the person, to encourage that beautiful part, to acknowledge it, maybe even to give them some positive feedback on the things they're doing well, and just leave the other things aside. Because one, one thing I've noticed with my teacher, Arjun Brown, and I'm sure most of his disciples have experienced this, is that he gives you a sense of trust and respect. He sees your inner potential to a greater degree than we have the capacity to see it ourselves. And because of that, it's not that we think, oh, we can slack off because he thinks I'm fine, you know. No, you want to live up to that. You want to really um, respect and honour the trust that he's invested in you, that he's given you without you having to deserve. And that is such a beautiful thing. So when we give ourselves that trust and respect automatically, or we give another person a sense of encouragement, a sense of um, self-worth, really, by engaging with the beautiful part of them, then we actually encourage that beauty to flourish inside their own heart. We give them a sense that something else is possible. And we don't have to point out all the faults. 
apparently if you point out a fault to somebody it takes at least five compliments after that to kind of redress the <laughs> redress the deficit it's like we've got um teflon for the good stuff you know this is the problem right because we want to have a mind that's actually absorbent of the good stuff but unfortunately our mind's like teflon for praise and like kind of a sieve, not a sieve, like something that's not a sieve. What could it be? Like a bucket for blame. We just let it pile up, you know. And, uh, and this is really a problem. Another bit of research is it takes something like 30 seconds to, for praise or encouragement to sink in and about two seconds for a criticism. <laughs> So we look at things differently, you know, maybe you remember an incident in your mind when you sit down to meditate that kind of bothers you and you think, oh, this person definitely was disrespecting me, you know. For example, something happened in our monastery recently and um, one of us said something like, oh, isn't this done yet, right? Quite neutrally, actually, quite neutrally, but the person heard that as a criticism. Isn't this done yet? And this becomes even worse if our sense of self is attached to being efficient, you know, or fast, or very, very competent, and then somebody says, isn't it done yet? And, oh, your self-image gets destroyed. <laughs> it becomes even worse if the person who said that is someone that you're trying to impress, right? Then you get even more miserable. But maybe that person didn't mean it that way. So we can look at it in a different way, or we can figure that perhaps that person was tired, perhaps they were in a hurry, perhaps they were just kind of talking to themselves. However you can reframe something to give that person the benefit of the doubt and to reduce this possibility of getting into ill will. Yeah. Another example, and this is about sound, but I think sound is one of the most difficult because you know, we take in what people say to us almost like knives, don't we? I think somewhere in the suttas it says that we've been given, like our tongue is like a, is like a, um, a knife. We have like a, a, a dagger in our mouth. And it's true, isn't it? You know? Somewhere else in the suttas it says people, even in the Buddha's day, were shouting and arguing together and they were using words like verbal daggers. <laughs> instead of using beautiful speech. And that's how speech can be. Um, so, of course, we have to be careful to guard our speech, but also if people um, say words that hurt us, to try to see it in context. Maybe this person's having a really difficult time. Maybe they're suffering. Maybe they've just been given a diagnosis that's terrifying for them. You know, once upon a time in a monastery... There was a nun who was always very, she seemed to me, quite grumpy. And I would try to engage with her in a positive way and say good morning. Uh, and sometimes she sneezed over breakfast once and I said, bless you. And she said, bless you, it's only a sneeze. Bless you, bless you. I was like, oh, oh dear. Okay, I better not say anything. But then later on, I found out that this person had suffered a great tragedy and the loss of a child before they took robes and that they came to the monastery just to practice and not to engage, not to be particularly social. And okay, fine, I mean, we can always say something polite to somebody, perhaps, but is it really necessary? You know, can we give somebody the benefit of the doubt? Can we just presume that they might have an inner struggle that we know nothing about? So I asked myself after that, why did I need to know that in order to have compassion? You know, why can't we presume that everybody's struggling with something? And maybe their response is nothing to do with us. In fact, it's usually not, because people can't know us and they don't really think that much about us. Most people are thinking about themselves and just trying to... <laughs> well, it's true. <laughs> trying to um, deal with their own inner world, isn't it? You know that story by Ajahn Brown? When you're young, you think that everybody's thinking about you. Then when you're kind of between 30 and 60 or something, you start to think about yourself. And then after you're 60, you realize that nobody was ever thinking about you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a while. <laughs> but this is the way it goes. So even when we meditate, you know, we have these... Uh, 
these thoughts that bother the mind. And the Buddha said that for somebody who really, you know, doesn't seem to show any kind of beneficial speech or behavior, we have to consider them like a sick person, like a person who's lost their way, a person who's suffering, gravely afflicted by a disease and without a medical attendant, without medicine and without a suitable guide. And I think those similes are kind of meant as uh, metaphors for the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. This person doesn't have the Buddha's teachings. Right? This person doesn't have the guide or the attendant, the Sangha. And they don't have the medicine. Mm -hmm. They don't have the Dhamma. So we have compassion for them instead and we understand that this could be us. If we were in their situation, we'd probably be just the same. Sometimes when you hear about people's life stories, it's just remarkable that people have even survived. And sometimes people are struggling with so many difficult health conditions or difficult um, family situations, and yet they really rise above it and find great meaning in either learning from that or actually developing an enormous amount of compassion. Um, yeah, and, and just determining to do something different, you know to really help other people on the path. I think that's such a beautiful thing, and it's something that I often contemplate if I'm going through difficulties, that if I can really turn towards this with kindness, with gentleness, with compassion, then I'm going to have so much more ability to help other people going through something similar. You know, Especially if I can depersonalize that. So one of the things about compassion is seeing that you know we're all in this together, there's this aspect of common humanity as opposed to isolation. You're not in this alone. And also we learn to be kind to ourselves instead of judging ourselves. The two things are kind of the opposite, right? Judging means we don't understand. We think it could be different somehow. We're lacking empathy. Compassion understands. It has empathy. Even if we can't really put ourselves in someone else's shoes, at least we can realize there might be things they're battling with that are beyond our own experience, you know. Maybe we have a lot of privileges in our life that we're not always aware of, and we can instead be very grateful for that, yeah. The other thing is mindfulness as opposed to over-identification. These are different aspects of compassion. But the really interesting thing about this, I was teaching about compassion recently in London, and um, it seems that kindness on its own is not enough. If you only have kindness, self-kindness, but you don't have this perspective that we're all in this together, there's a sense of common humanity that unites us in suffering, in old age, sickness and death, and in our happiness, our shared happiness as well. If we don't have that perspective, self-kindness doesn't do very much for us. So this is a bit of a blow to the kind of... Um, self-help industry, <laughs> buy the bubble bath, have a relaxing evening with the hot chocolate and everything will be good. It's not really enough. And I think it also points to the Buddha's genius in, in teaching right view, you know, teaching this perspective that uh, all beings suffer and recoil from pain. All beings desire happiness. And we're just going about it in the best way that we know we can. Some of us don't have very much... Uh, um, guidance as to how to do it better but we do the best we can and when we look back on our own lives we think oh my goodness how could I have been so stupid you know if I knew then what I know now I wouldn't have made those mistakes and that's a really good sign of progress one more thing about the resentment that's interesting in this sutta is that the Buddha actually talks about overcoming resentment to a person whose body and speech are pure and this is very interesting, isn't it? That sometimes we can actually have resentment towards people we think maybe are happier than us. Maybe we have jealousy instead of goodwill, instead of being able to rejoice with them. So in this case, the Buddha likens it to um, a person who's basically full of um, uh, happiness and often gets deep meditation, you might have heard about other people's deep meditation and you're thinking, oh gosh, that's so unfair, this person doesn't seem particularly special. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? <laughs> they don't even seem that mindful. They haven't even been practicing as long as me, right? So why should they get all this bliss? And instead of that, 
But Buddha says that when we meet such a person, it's like coming in contact with the shade of a tree, you know, or I'm not sure if the lake is in there too, but I imagine it like there's this beautiful lake and there's this shade of a tree. And instead of feeling jealous or feeling, um, you know, resentment to such a person and using that to kind of put yourself down, um, we can actually go and seek refuge with such a person. We can talk to them, we can, we can seek their advice, we can develop humility. You know, we can learn from what they have, what their special qualities are. Recognizing that doesn't take anything away from us. We all have our strengths. Some people have more wisdom. Some people have more stillness. Some people have more generosity, you know. We all have different virtues developed to different degrees. Different factors of the path developed to different degrees. And certainly very, very different challenges in our lives. You know, if I was judging myself now, or my practice now, based on... Uh, you know, in relation to my practice in the past, sometimes I might think, well, it's not as easy to, you know, get my meditation going as it was when I had much time to myself and a lot of sense restraint. But I can also look at it in a different way. I can see that I'm developing beautiful qualities of service. I'm a lot more um, able to share, like more confident to share a lot more resilient, more patient. Sometimes we can see that our challenges are great, right? We have a very hectic day and we think, gosh, look, I'm getting irritated. But I know for myself, I wouldn't even be doing this 10 years ago. You know, I wouldn't even be in the place where I'd be in the playing field. So, of course, maybe I wouldn't have got irritated because I wouldn't have done it <laughs> at all, right? So we can't judge other people because we don't understand what they're dealing with. And this is really beautiful. The other thing, of course, that um, we can develop by seeing a person who's really pure is we can have a lot of joy for them. And that becomes a source of happiness inside for ourselves. Because sometimes compassion is a beautiful quality. I think it's a very um, noble quality in the sense that it's connected with suffering it has this inherent wisdom within it because it seeks and wishes and works towards the freedom from suffering for all living beings. So there's something sober about it, there's something about it that's in touch with the reality. And we focus on the freedom from suffering so that it doesn't get heavy, it doesn't get us down. We don't grieve with people, but we focus on that wish for their freedom and do something to help them flourish in life. But a complement to that is actually the practice of sympathetic joy. And we can practice this throughout the day. You know, we can practice feeling happy for other people's success. And this brings us a lot of gladness. One of the people I find this very easy to do it for is Ajahn Brahm. Mm. Because we talk mostly every week and he shares his practice with me from time to time. Sometimes he doesn't have to say very much. He just comes along and he's got this quiet sort of twinkle in his eye. And I can, I'll be like, hmm, you've had a nice meditation. He's like, hmm, <laughs> yes. And it's very quiet, you know. But then if we start to talk about, say, something like faith or something like the Buddha or something like inspiration or PT or deep meditation, we both get so happy. <laughs> it's like there's so much joy. And he actually sometimes says, I, I can't keep talking like this, so I'll have to just go into deep meditation. It's like his mind is getting so inspired just through thinking that way. And I pick that up. It's incredibly inspiring for me. So I just feel so happy for him because this is someone who I can sense has really found peace. You know, it doesn't mean his life is always easy. He's actually has a lot of duties and responsibilities, but he knows how to put that down and how to let everything become quiet. So I guess I've talked around this in ways that maybe I hope are helpful, but not necessarily what I'd planned. But there is one more part of this um, sense restraint, which I want to touch on by using some examples from the texts. And this is helpful, I think, for people who are um, perhaps... Uh, wisdom inclined. I mean, these are practices based on seeing a little bit of the nature of the senses, the impermanence of those things, and also to help us to quieten the senses down. 
And it's a very beautiful passage because it's talking about quietening them by seeing their uh, impermanent nature. And of course, here we're quietening our senses by simply um, having less sensory input altogether, keeping ourselves very contained. But the next stage of that is to turn towards something more peaceful, more beautiful, more quiet. And this is, you know, in the theme of this retreat throughout, that we're not just giving one thing up that's exciting for us and having nothing in its place. The more we can relinquish the inferior happiness, the more we can take in, soak up, attune to a more peaceful and sublime happiness that comes from inside. And that's so much more reliable. If you think about it, we don't need to depend on those external things because those things are inside. So this is from that same sutta, the Majjhima number 152. It's the very last sutta for anyone who um, wants to find it in the Majjhima Nikaya. And this is how the Buddha describes the supreme development of the faculties. Remember the story about how this Brahmin came to the Buddha and said, well, you just don't look, you just don't hear. And the Buddha said, no, this is how we do it instead. So here, when someone sees a form with the eye, there arises what is agreeable, what is disagreeable, and what is both agreeable and disagreeable. And then one understands thus, there has arisen what is agreeable, there has arisen what is disagreeable, and there has arisen both what is agreeable and disagreeable. But that is conditioned, gross, dependently arisen, Remember we were talking about the conditioned nature of the senses? They're dependent on that contact. However, this is peaceful. This is sublime. That is equanimity. So instead, we realize these things are conditioned and gross, yeah, and dependently arisen. In other words, coarse. Gross means kind of coarse, stimulating, not peaceful. But there's something that is peaceful, something that is sublime. And in this example, that's equanimity. Equanimity is another word in a way for contentment or for peace. It's being able to stay steady, no matter what those sense impressions are. Being able to find that place of equipoise inside that's not affected, that's not pulled around by the world. And it has a certain flavor, it has a certain taste. At first, when we experience peace or equanimity, it might seem like a blank, it might seem a little bit dull. But the longer we can stay with it and turn towards it and allow it to build, the more it starts to kind of shimmer and glow. It starts to become really beautiful, really cool and quiet and can take us into deep meditation. And then he has these little similes. So that's the same for all the senses. But the similes that are really nice, I'll just read them out in brief. So the agreeable that arises, the disagreeable and both um, that arose cease in a person and equanimity is established. In other words, when we don't engage with these things, they disappear from our awareness. And we're left with that equanimity. So here is the simile for sight. Just as a person with good sight, having opened their eyes, might shut them, or having shut their eyes, might open them. So too, concerning anything at all, the agreeable, disagreeable, or both, that arose, cease just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as easily, and equanimity is established. So that's how fast the eye consciousness works, just like this. You can shut your eyes and it's gone. How can it be yours? How can it be a self? So it's the same for the other um, similes. The one about, uh, what's this one? The sound is that just as a strong person might easily snap their fingers, so too concerning the agreeable, disagreeable, or both that arose, cease just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as easily, and equanimity is established. Then a person smells an odor with the nose, just as raindrops and a slightly sloping lotus leaf roll off and do not remain there, concerning anything at all, agreeable, disagreeable or both, that arose, they cease just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as easily, 
and equanimity is established. And then for tasting a flavour, just as a person might easily spit out a ball of spittle collected on the tip of their tongue, <laughs> so too concerning anything at all, and this means flavours, agreeable, disagreeable or both, they cease just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as easily, and equanimity is established. So I don't know, when you see that chocolate brownie, do you think of just spitting it out and then eating it again? Ooh. That's how quick flavour is, isn't it? You eat it one minute, it's nice, the next minute, gone. You want to spit it out. <laughs> and then for the touch, so a person touches a tangible with the body. So this is any contact that you experience in the body. It could be contact from another person. Somebody touches you in a pleasant way, like we caress the little dog in here, or somebody kind of knocks into you. And one understands, just as a strong person might extend their flexed arm or flex their extended arm, so too concerning any touches, agreeable or disagreeable or both, they cease just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as easily and equanimity is established. And then this is a really lovely one because this is the mind. So when a person cognizes a mind object with the mind, so mind objects, so far we've talked about mind objects related to sight, sound, smell and taste, but what about things like nimittas? They're mind objects too, the lights that arise or beautiful visions. They seem like visions, right? Sometimes they are related to the eye sense door, maybe memories of visions you've seen in the past. But really they're not being seen with the eye, they're being seen with the mind. So they become mind objects. So when a person cognizes a mind object with the mind, there arises what's agreeable, disagreeable, or both. You can't only have pleasant visions or pleasant mind objects. Yeah, You can't only have unpleasant ones either. It will change. So one understands that, uh, we've got dot, dot, dots here. One understands that there arises what is both agreeable, disagreeable, and neither, or both. But that is conditioned, gross, dependently arisen. This is peaceful, this is sublime, that is equanimity. Just as if a person were to let two or three drops of water fall onto an iron plate, heated for a whole day. The falling of the drops might be slow, but they would quickly vaporise and vanish. <laughs> Maybe like some limiters, they come up, takes all this time to get a little light in the mind, and then bang, it's gone. That's life. So too, concerning anything at all, the agreeable, the disagreeable, and both. They cease just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as easily, and equanimity is established. This is called the supreme development of the faculties. So, this is another kind of practice similar to what we've been doing, but I think it's really helpful to start noticing what it is we're reacting to and start to break these things down. Because when we see life as something solid, when we imagine our experience, our world as something solid, we're not really aware of how we're responding. We're not really aware of how conditioned it is, of how impermanent it is. We take it to be ourself, you know, mine. A person is my partner. I am my body. But when we start to see the impermanent nature and see how these things only arise based on conditions, then we can loosen our grip on that. We cannot give them so much importance. We can really let them calm down. And it's letting things calm down that is, you know, the entryway into peaceful states of mind. The other important thing is to let go even of the desire for mental bliss, right? That's another object. That's another object that arises when the causes are there and passes away when they disappear. And it's precisely that desire that gets in the way. You know, most people who've had some experience of deep meditation will frequently say, and it's happened to me, that at the most unexpected times, it doesn't happen when you're trying to make it happen. 
because you're far too involved. It happens when you least expect it. You know, there was one time for me in Perth years ago, practicing on a rains retreat, and uh, the mind was quite peaceful, but kind of nothing special. I didn't notice any particular bliss. And of course, I've heard there should be bliss, but whatever. I was just happy, meditating peacefully. And then I noticed that uh, I remembered, and some words came to mind from Ajahn Brahm. Very simple words. He said simply, notice peace. Or it might have been noticed bliss. Either way, suddenly my mind really turned in that direction. Instead of just thinking, oh, this is nothing special. Part of my mind's here, part of my mind's elsewhere. I really let myself notice it, let myself soak it in. And suddenly it just exploded in my mind. It was like, without any effort at all, it was just that turning toward, that noticing. It's not even a turning, it's just a noticing what's already there made all the difference and everything kind of developed from there. So this is all we have to do quite often. And I was teaching a retreat in, in Devon as well recently. I think you were on that retreat, the Metta retreat. And a few people were saying, yeah, it's kind of peaceful, but nothing kind of blissful. And I just reminded them about contentment, that you know, basically the most important ingredient in this practice is to want to be where you are, to want to be where you are don't want to be somewhere you're not, want to be right here. And as soon as we can become so content that we stay where we are, the whole process starts turning inward. You stop going onward to the next thing. Everything starts to go inward, you go deeper into where you are. And these people also had lights arising, a feeling of expansiveness of the body, of the mind. And this was simply by being content. We often practice from a place of lack, thinking we need something more, thinking we have to do something better, we don't have enough skill, and it's the precise opposite. That's what keeps you distant from the goal of contentment. So make contentment your goal of this retreat. If there's only one goal, that's the goal. <laughs> better if there's no goals, but contentment is the ending of goals. So be content with whatever arises and see if you can develop your senses so that you're not so affected by the sights, sounds, sm smells, tastes and touches and objects of the mind. So use this sort of area of practice to increase the wholesome states and to see if you can diminish unwholesome ways of relating to the world. Okay.